Greetings, dear friends. Welcome to another Church in the Home. It is a blessing to have you in our audience today, and we pray God's greatest blessings upon you. There are some of you that are being greatly used of the Lord. You're carrying the Lord's message. In fact, some of you take this very message we're making and sending to you now on a CD and are reproducing it and getting it into hungry hearts and needy hands. We pray for you that God will use you and bless you in a wonderful way so that not only is your day made complete by serving God, but think of the multitudes of people, even Christian people, who don't know Christ lives in them. You're the missionary. You are the one that brings a living Christ to them, and I encourage you to keep on doing so. We encourage you in the Lord. And speaking of encouragement, today we send a special message to our Australian office in Sydney. Our little Jenny Astabel works hard there, and she keeps the message going out in New Zealand and Australia. And Jenny, we just want to say a big thank you to you, and pray God's richest blessings upon you, your husband, and your children, that you'll be more greater used of God than you ever dreamt before, for certainly we're nearing the time that people won't hear the truth much anymore. Jesus is coming, and we're ready to meet him. So God bless you, Jenny, today, and all of our friends in Australia that'll be getting this particular CD. And then I want to encourage people in the United States once again to get reservations in for camp meeting. Camp meeting is July the 30th to August the 4th. The camp meeting is down in uh, Asheville, North Carolina at the biggest conference center, Christian conference center in America called Ridgecrest. Get your reservations in now because we're filling up. We're bringing in people from near and far. We're even getting some from foreign countries interested in it, and we want you to show your interest by filling out a registration form. Especially our people here in the United States need to do that right now, if you will. Just send it in to our office, and we'll feel good about this. This is, has the earmarks of the greatest conference we've ever had. We have people coming into it whose witness and testimony is as powerful as they could possibly be. And you want to be there. You want to be a part of that. So get your uh, reservation in as soon as you can. Now we're going to hear a word from my dear wife, Robbie. God bless you, Robbie, as you speak. <laughs> well, you know, it's a family affair. <laughs> uh, when I was growing up in Sunday school, um, parents drove us to church, and we all went different directions. Kids went to the children's church, and the women went to the women's class, and the men went to the men's class. And all the parents said, ah. <laughs> rid of them for two hours. <laughs> um, and then when we had our children, we kind of did the same thing. We just departmentalized, uh, not quite as much as probably we did when I was growing up. but. Um, I really wish, if I had any wishes, I would wish that I could go back and redo some of those years where I would know what my children were being taught. Um, we, <coughs> we, assumed, we assumed that um, whoever stepped into that class came prepared and, and was teaching the children um, um, the things of the Lord, but years later we found out that much of it was babysitting time. And um, we tried classes here for a while, but uh, a lot of the parents said we'd like to have our children sitting in the meetings, um, and the kids like it. It's it's um, your family as a part of the big family, and uh, it's really amazing how much they absorb and how much they get from the teaching. Even you know when it, it when it seems like they're not really paying attention, <coughs> they get so much from the teaching. But most of all, from your expression of Christ to them your hugs, your saying hello, your being Anna's audience today. Um, Christ's expression in us to these children, to these young people too. Um, I'll have to say, much of my, my life has been um, not a very good expression of Christ. I was a good expression of Irish a lot of times. Um, I was a good expression of religion you know, that's what, religion's where you say one thing and do another. <laughs> but um, it's really a wonderful thing when you come, when you come to know him as in spontaneous living. And uh, you know, there's an awful lot of unlearning religion to learn Christ. Did you know that? 
<coughs> a lot of unlearning to learn Christ. <coughs> well, we don't really know what to unlearn and what to hold on to much of the time. And, of course, the Spirit doesn't want us <laughs> whacking away at ourselves, trying to do away with what we think is flesh and holding on to what we think might be spirit. Um, but what I found out is I, as, as we learn Christ, as we just continue to learn Christ, it is amazing what drops off. Amen. It's amazing what the Father sets aside. <clears throat> Warren has said all the time, if, you don't, if, you, if you're not in the place of understanding or receiving, just set it on a shelf for a while. And, um, and, and I, I've had to do a lot of that. You have too. Well, you take a lot of things, because we're coming into this new understanding of Christ as our life, rather than the works-oriented. I, I grew up in very legal, legalistic religion, where it, was, um, <clears throat> it, all, it all hinged on me doing it, and doing it right, and doing it all the time, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but to, to come to know, to know Christ as our life, and it is Christ, you know, we're the container, and he's the life. We're the cup, and he's the coffee, you know. There will always be two, but the two are one. And, um, of course, there's been days past when we said that. People ran away saying, oh, they say, they're saying they're little Christ running around. <laughs> well, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that we're the container, and he's the content. And, you know, it says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And, you know, that's <laughs> all you and I will ever be is an old clay pot. But most of, my, most of my life in religion, I was always working on the clay pot. <laughs> I wasn't learning a whole lot about the treasure. Bits and pieces, I came to know him as my savior um, at 15. But all those years, it was always that God was just looking at this clay pot, whether I had this on or didn't have that on, or whether I looked this way or didn't look this way, you know. It was, it was always, I always thought it, it, that all he had to do was to check this clay pot out every day. You know, and of course, most of the time, I didn't measure up. I knew that. But what a difference. What a difference when we come to know him as a treasure. And our concentration, our concern, our longing, our, our joy is learning of this treasure. We hold this treasure in earthen vessels. Why did he put the treasure in earthen vessels? That the power might be of God and not of us, Paul says. So... Um, <clears throat> I still work on the clay pot, <laughs> but, but not, the, not the emphasis that it's pleasing to the Father. But rather than to, to allow this Christ to come forth, because he's the lover. You know, you and I can just love in ourselves just so far. Is that right, Is that right Raphael? Our love just goes so far, doesn't it? And then we fizzle out. But I'm so glad that he's the lover. That, that when, when I can't love... I can, I, can, I can let him be the lover in me. Um, um, he's my righteousness. I worked so long. I was raised in Pentecost, and so was he most of his life. And, and in Pentecost, you're just always you know, trying to be righteous enough to be acceptable. But what a joy when I came to find out that Christ was made unto me my righteousness. He's made unto, my, unto me sanctification and redemption. And, and um, I joy in that. What a relief that was to come into knowing him as my life. And um, we have people in this room from all different backgrounds. You know, we don't sit around and talk doctrine anymore, do we? We don't, we don't pull each other's hair out over doctrine anymore, do we? Because we just want to know this Christ. <laughs> We're so excited about seeing how Christ is expressed through each of us differently. But, he's, but he's, a, he's the same Christ. He's the same love. He's the same joy. He's the same peace and rest in, in each one of us. Now we're going to move on. Our message and song today will be brought to you by our little lady from the Indianapolis Fellowship. God bless her. Uh, she's been so greatly used to the Lord through the years. And Jean Scott is her name and Christ is her life. So Jean, go ahead and sing for us. As soon as she finishes her song, we'll go right into the message. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice 
I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. We are the sons, we are the sons of the living God, of the living God. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad we are, and be glad we are. We are the sons of the living God. I will rejoice and be glad we are. We are the sons, we are the sons of the living God. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter those courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Now if you will take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the message. The message. When I came to the understanding that Paul had a special message and that his gospel was a gospel never used anywhere else in the scriptures and that his gospel on his own part was called my gospel meaning that Jesus had done something to him and for him that made him feel very personal in his relationship to that gospel. In other words, it wasn't a gospel that came through Abraham, not a gospel that came through Isaiah, not a gospel that came through uh, any of the other greats, not even one of the twelve apostles. But it was a gospel that Jesus had strategically given to him by many revelations. And so he had a right, I suppose, to call it my gospel, and he did three different times. He said it was my gospel. When I picked up on the fact that Paul had a special message to believers, when he had something special from Christ that God had never given to human beings before, and Christ had never spoken, perhaps he got nearly to the subject in two or three places in his ministry, but he never spoke of it before. But when Paul was raised up, he gave to him the message. I like to call it the message. This is the message which we have heard of him, the scriptures declare. John, I think, said that. And we believe in the message. We believe that the world needs this message. And to the world without this message will never be complete in Christ. So the message has always been a deep and penetrating and powerful aspect of what I had to bring to people. Because I could see it was a clear message, not messed up by all sorts of religious ideas. Religiousosity was not found in most of Paul's epistles. You'd have to really 
uh, turn them around and jump up and down on them a few times to get something like that out of them. But the fact is, the Apostle Paul gave us a message all the way from his first epistle of Thessalonians all the way through to 2 Timothy. He has a message. And that message is usually clear. And I want you to understand that because the message is important in what we have to say in the Christ life. And then another thing happened. When we begin to discover that Christ lived in us, based on Paul's revelation in Galatians 1, please God who separated me from my mother's womb, call me by His grace to reveal His Son in me. Whenever that took place, it was such an inspiring and such a, I don't know how to put it, it was a real uh, explosion in my life. And I began to bring it to other people, and they had the explosion in their life that where have we been all these years and didn't hear what Paul had to say in the message. Well, the reason we didn't hear it was because most people don't understand how it works. And so from the first time I began to search out the in Christ statements in Paul, and that was one of the first things I did. When I got a hold of his message, the first thing I did was go through all his epistles and found and marked 146 times he says we're in Christ, in Christ. That was the very basis of what he had to say. If, if you haven't come that far, if you don't see that in the Scriptures, we really have nothing to talk about because the in Christ statement is used more in Paul's epistles than any other statement, whether it be faith, love, power, Holy Spirit. All of those are secondary in quantity to what Paul had to say about being in Christ. So that, that struck me. I, that struck me to where I was willing to give my life to it. If that's the most often thing stated in all of the, in all of the New Testament from one man on one subject, then I ought to pay attention to it. And so from that point on, I began to grow in the Lord. But the next big thing that hit me was if Christ is in us, how did he get there? How did we get Christ in us? Of course, my mind went immediately, well, we've all been born again. But that doesn't say how Christ was put in us. That doesn't explain that. And so my mind for a long time began to center in this idea, how does Christ get in a believer? And then I discovered from many writers that that's a figurative thing. Don't lay any stress on it. That's just figurative. He doesn't really get in you. Well, I thought about my Pentecostal background. All Pentecostals believe they have the Holy Ghost in them. That's the theme of their message. Well, if they have the Holy Ghost in them, why would it be so hard to have Christ in you? Well, I know how people get the Holy Ghost. They work real hard. That's the hardest work I ever had when I was in that phase of my life. And they all based it on the fact that J Jesus said, tarry until... And, and a lot of them that are strict legalists said, if you don't tarry a long time, it's no good if you get it. So the longer you tarry, the better it is. That's hard work. Most of you never went through that. I did in my early days. I went through that, and that was a penetrating thing in my life. If this, if this is grace, well, of course, we never mentioned grace in that phase. There was no grace at that time. It was all works. Good works, we thought. And a lot of people did a lot of good things, and I did a lot of good things, but it didn't have... Paul's message. It didn't have the truth. So the question kept working in me, how do we get Christ in us? Where does he come from? How is it we can say Christ is in us? For instance, when Paul makes a statement about the in Christ position in Galatians 2.20, he'll say, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Previous to that, the line had said, I no longer live, Christ liveth in me. Well, if, if you take those words literally, they're mind-blowing. You're out of finite comprehension. And so I had preached and taught those things many times and didn't have the slightest idea what they meant. I just found something somebody said about it and uh, enlarged upon it and put my two cents worth in, but I didn't have the slightest idea about what it was all about. And that's the way religion has done it. Galatians 2.20 has always been there. That's a mind-blowing statement if you were to take it literally. And I must tell you, most theologians do not take Galatians 2.20 literally. So consequently, you don't get any backup material as to what that means. And then Paul would say in another place, Christ 
liveth in me. He doesn't even say Christ's spirit liveth in me, which is what I believe is salvation. He doesn't say that. He says Christ liveth in me. The life I now live is Christ, Paul would say. Well, what has he done here? He has taken this person of Christ whose spirit has been joined to our spirit. That's what salvation is. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. He's taken those statements and made them so personal to the person of Christ that you either have to dismiss them or you have to deal with them. You, you dismiss them as modern religion has. They're completely dismissed. Uh, like the New Living Bible will cut out every one of Paul's in Christ statements. They cut them out. They don't know what to do with that, you see. And so multitudes of believers are left with what are we, what are we going to do with this statement? Well, they buy all kinds of books. And the books that tell them what to do, according to Galatians 2.20, is a whole lot different than what Galatians 2.20 says is. It's not a book, it's not a statement to do. It's a statement that is, something is. I am crucified with Christ. That's not something that's going to happen. That's something that happened 2,000 years ago. Nevertheless, I live. Well, we all live. Yet it's not me that lives, it's Christ who lives in me. So the whole of the statement must be either taken literally or you just need to wipe it out. Wipe it out. Get it out of your mind. But if you're a Bible student and you love the Word, you're going to have to deal with that kind of statement. How do we get Christ in us? It's not like the people who tarry for the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost came in, they all talked in tongues. So they had a, they had a voucher right from God. You got it. See, you got it. Now I can see that they got it the moment they were saved, but that's in the bucket of grace. And uh, we didn't know anything about that way back there. How did they get it? I'm going to read a text from Peter that will say a little bit about how it works and how you get Christ in you. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, let's begin to read it, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, that's religion, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now you see, these first two verses have established that we're not talking about ordinary religion. Verse 20, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Ah, have you circled that word before? Every time you read that word before, circle it. Because that word takes us back before the world was created. The present day gospel is based on Adam and Eve's sin and the eradication of that sin. That's another gospel. But the gospel that comes before the foundation of the world is the gospel we're most interested in. But was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him Glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing that you purified your souls. All right, that's a statement of a whole other truth. And, but since I go by it, I can't just pass these things and not mention them. There is no salvation of the soul taught by the Apostle Paul. What is taught? The salvation of the soul is a continuous work of God. It's walking in the Spirit. It's living in the Word. It's measuring up statements that are in the epistles. It's uh, growing up into Christ. That's what soulish salvation is. Modern religion has made soulish salvation the religion. Why is it they don't preach Christ in us? It's simple. They don't know about spirit salvation. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. That's different, you see. So Peter is right on, the, right on the nose with this thing. He says, seeing you have purified your souls. What is that? That's effort. That's self-effort. Who, who purifies the soul? You do. Christ in you doesn't make you read your Bible. He could give you a hunger 
But he doesn't make you do right. He doesn't, he doesn't make you do anything. Then how do you get better? How do you obey the truth? You do it because you are responsible. You see that first line? Seeing you have purified your minds. Ah, that's where, that's where spiritual growth is, is in your soul mind. In obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with pure heart fervently. See, those are the things you do because Christ is in you. What is that? That's the salvation of the soul. I don't like to say it every time I talk about this, but remember, salvation of the soul is Old Testament. Salvation of the soul is what Jesus of Nazareth taught. There was no spirit salvation. There was no Holy Spirit baptizing believers into Christ until the day of Pentecost started. So always keep that in mind. Soul salvation, which is commonly used today in terminology, belongs to the Old Testament because only the soul was saved. There was no spirit salvation. There was no Christ joined to the spirit of human beings in the Old Testament, not until Paul had his revelation. So he says here that you love one another with pure heart fervently. Who does that? You do that because of your love affair with Christ. But now we're getting to the text. Being born again, not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. <clears throat> I hate to stop every time before I get to my point, but how do people come to know the things of God? Is there some guy like me that comes along and says, oh, here's the way it ought to be? Only ignorant people would believe that because Paul says several times, and I'm recording those times. I don't have it at hand right now, but he says several times, you get this from the Word of God. Searching the Scriptures. Rightly dividing the Word of God. He's saying this many times, that you can get the truth from the Scriptures. But what keeps us from doing that? Some man comes along and says, no, don't go in that direction. Here's the way to go. Let the Scriptures speak to you. Paul says here, being born again, Born again, not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible. How do you come to that? By the Word of God. By the Word of God. I want that to register with you. Because the Word of God liveth and abideth forever. Now, he used the term born again. That's the way he explained how Christ gets in you. He's rebirthed in you, and that's right. That's good. But strangely, the first one to ever use that was Jesus of Nazareth, who did nothing about it. You recall it in John 3rd chapter, Jesus talks to Nicodemus and tells him that you must be born again or you can't see or enter the things of God. But nothing more was said about it. Isn't that funny? I, I have very few people to question that. Why didn't Jesus talk about it? Well, first place it wasn't time. Then why did he talk it to Nicodemus? Because Nicodemus was a big monkey monk of Judaism. He was the head of the council. He was the head of the organization. So Jesus just went out of his way and told Nicodemus that nothing you're doing is going to work until you're rebirthed. I don't know what Nicodemus could have done with that. I know Nicodemus did the most blessed thing that anybody that followed Jesus ever did because he and Joseph of Arimathea went and took Jesus off the cross. And I've always remarked that that was, that was a better thing than anybody else had done because there wasn't anybody else to care for that body. Think about it. Nobody. But Nicodemus, he did care. He was interested in it. The Apostle Paul never used the term born again. That's strategic also. Because when he got the message, he got more than Nicodemus got. He got more than Jesus said about abiding in him. Me and you and you and me and us in the Father. He 
tied it up into a technical aspect. And he said, what this really is, is a receiving of another person, another life, and another nature in the human being. And he said, I'm going to call it a great mystery. It's a mystery. He says, there's never going to be anybody that comes along that's going to be able to explain this. Isn't it funny in this last American election we had, you folks around the world bear with me, uh, we had all our politicians here that were negative criticizing the born again people, slurring, making slurring statements about Christians, all oh, their bunch of evangelicals, or they're the born again, like we uh, were, were nothing or somebody. I don't know what they meant by it. Anyhow, nobody does. There's not anybody that knows and understands what a born-again believer is. When I taught in college, uh, that was one of the first things I did to students. I'd say, now I want you to take a sheet of paper and write on it what it means to be born again and how you got there. Well, I heard life stories mostly. I heard how they said this man was holding a revival and I didn't want to go, but I finally made up my mind to go to please my mama, but I couldn't get out of that service without giving my heart to the Lord. That was their explanation of being born again. There was no concept in their thinking that another person has been added to the vessel of this life. No concept. Well, you could, I couldn't blame the students, but I was destined to go into that and teach that as time went, went by in that semester or whatever time period it was. Born again. Paul says to be born again is a great mystery and that there's no way we're going to lay it out to you. But it does kind of get laid out. It kind of gets laid out by Peter here because he says being born again not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible. How does he begin to explain it? He says that your first birthing has absolutely nothing to do with your rebirthing. Two different, two different seeds. And you know, I think we would have helped a lot of Christian people it's taken me a long time to figure this out. But we would have helped a lot of Christian people who now stumble if we could have preached when they were unsaved that it's not enough just to get down and get saved. You need to know who you are. Who are you? Before you get saved, you're sitting here listening to my message. Who are you? You're somebody who has been created into life by a corruptible seed. That's who you are. That's who you are. Well, that's the Satan seed. That's the Adam seed. That's the sin nature. You're birthed by that the first time. But he says that's not the birthing. He says you must be rebirthed, and his words are, but of the incorruptible that comes by study of the Word of God. Now, if I lay anything on you today that's important, you need to get into the Scriptures and prove that. All Scripture is by inspiration and helps us to reprove, to understand. I encourage you to do it. Don't take my word. That's too precious. We never had to tell you you had an incorruptible seed in you. Holy Ghost conviction told you one. One day you're going to go to hell. You're not going to make it. Nothing's going to work out right if you don't give your heart to Jesus. So you had somebody teaching you about the, your life of sin, but you never took it as a seed that made you who you were. Where was that seed? Joined to your spirit. That's why Paul could say in Romans 7, the things I wanted to do I couldn't do and the things I didn't want to do I did all the time. What was he talking about? He was talking about the corruptible seed that was joined to his spirit. Amen. That had no power, no control over it. 
That's the message. We're, we're, our literature is going into a lot of rehabilitation centers right now. We had one man to order 200 books because he has uh, seven or eight rehabilitation centers, the book on Paul. And after he read it, he said, that's what they need. And we're going into these places right now, and our message has got to be to them, you continue to drink because you had an incorruptible seed. But if you've been born again, you have new life in you, but you've never changed your mind about the seed. You think you're still the same person, and you're not. A whole new nature takes hold when you're born again. We don't talk about that much, do we? Five times uh, the New Testament talks about believers having a nature, a new nature. We don't talk about that. When you get saved, you don't get a Baptist nature or a Presbyterian nature or a Catholic nature. When you get saved, Peter says you get a God nature. Boy, that's explosive, isn't it? That means everybody that's saved got a God nature in them. Why in the world don't it ever show up? <laughs> Their old sin nature showed up. There are people ought to be there. Are, there ought to be people in this meeting today, whose old sin nature still in their mind. They didn't show up, but it shows up. Why doesn't the God nature show up? Because they don't know the Word of God. They haven't gotten Paul's message, and he's the only one in this book that knows anything about it. Because he's the only one Jesus talked to. Keep that in your mind. You can praise all the 12 apostles and thank God for them. That was Jesus' work, but not a one of them knew this. Yes. Not a one of them. So the incorruptible seed is put in you. Well, have you missed it? What is a seed? That's sperm. What is sperm? Sperm is where the residence of a new life is. That's where it comes from, the male sperm. Whether it's for a corruptible seed or an incorruptible seed. The corruptible seed came from your mama or your daddy especially. The seed comes from the male, goes into the female egg. But when you got born again, your heavenly father put his seed in you. His seed, which is without sin, which is incorruptible which actually gave you a whole new life. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. You know what's wrong with Christianity? we got very few new creations. <laughs> Just think about it for a moment. Most everybody I know that's a Christian stumbles and falls and has trouble. And I never knew so much family trouble as I'm hearing today. I get the emails and letters all the time. Family trouble everywhere. A fellow uh, wrote me not long ago and he said, if I don't watch out, my brother's going to kill me. He hates me. <laughs> well, that's kind of the picture of our world. You watch the news today and you see it in the families constantly. How could you have the God seed in you and it not make a difference? I can tell you, it's a simple answer. You don't know about it. You don't know about it. Us preachers kept it from you. For years as a Baptist, I tried to get everybody I could saved to make my church numbers better. Then I became a Pentecostal and I tried to get everybody to talk in tongues because we thought that would shove them over into a new creature life. Didn't. Only by knowing Christ is in you are you going to make a change about your thinking and the who you are. Thinking about who you are. You're going to have to have a change there. <laughs> well, I got a hold of this one day. I got a hold of it from Brother John. He's the only apostle who followed Jesus that remembers what Jesus said that makes a difference to you and I. He was there in the 15th chapter of John. He tells the message as he heard it, writes the story, 
And he says, this is the way I got it. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. You know how much confusion has gone on in Christianity over the 15th chapter of John? I mean, everybody I read has a different answer to that. You know why there's a different answer and not a clear-cut message? It's because nobody knows about Christ living in the believer. Who is the vine? That's the lie. What I have in me, a vine, the Christ life. It's in me, been joined to me. Miracle of grace, Christ in me, my hope of glory. It's in me. What am I? I'm a branch. I'm a branch. I've always been a branch. I used to be a branch that was hooked on to the sin nature and Satan. And he just worked through me all the time. Blessed thing, uh, who is it? John says it, that, that Satan was a sinner from the beginning. For you scriptorians here, that's a good thing for you to take off on. Uh, what was he reaching to there? He was reaching to the fact that it wasn't me that sinned. In fact, he says that in another place. It wasn't, wasn't me that sinned. It was sin that was in me. Why? You're nothing but a branch. A branch has no life in it except it's attached to the vine. Right? Jose, a man works for us here. Cut down a big tree out here the other day. And it was a blessing because I got a whole lot of little bitty branches. What you'd have thought was good for nothing stuff. But boy, when I get ready to build a fire, they're the best things I got. Those little bitty branches. I got a whole bunch of big stuff that take all day long to get heated up. That's the difference between little believers who don't know a whole lot and big believers. Well, that's not. <laughs> that's another story. You see, they don't know they're just branches. And they think that when fruit comes out of their life, look what I did. Look who I am. Look what I'm doing. They don't tell the people that are watching them, this is not my fruit. I'm a branch. I just hold the fruit. He that is in me is the life. See, that was a big shift I made in Pentecost. Because I had to see something Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And that was the gifts, finally, do not belong to the believer. They belong to Christ. He's the life. And that's why in, in 1 Corinthians 13, he says they're going to pass away. And when they pass away, that which is perfect has come. What's perfect? It's Christ. Where is Christ? I just picked up a book uh, yesterday in my study and was thumbing through it of an old friend of mine, and I just noticed that statement, we'll become perfect when we get there on the resurrection morning, as if a believer never had Christ in them. Isn't that a shame that you can talk as if Christ is not in you? You do that on the job, you're the loser. You do that at home, you're the loser. Do you live as if Christ was not in you? I can't put up with that anymore. I've got to preach this message that he's in you. If you don't let him out, you're the loser. Now, he's not going to be a nickel to you on the resurrection morning. That's for here and now. That's what God intended for people who live on this earth to have and to come to. Well, I was talking about Brother John. He didn't write anything till almost 30 years after Paul died. Paul had been dead for many years. What made John pick up this message of the birthing? What made him look into it? Ah, oh, he stood there when Jesus was talking and heard Jesus say one day, I'm the vine, you're nothing but a branch. The life is in me, and the fruit is my fruit. He heard that. So his writings and his epistles 
are based on a whole different conclusion than any other one, than Peter or James or anyone else that followed Jesus before his death. His writings were different. Ah, I remember when he prayed his last prayer in the upper room, and he said that we were gifts to him, that God gave us to him. And he said, no, Father, I'm going to give them back to you. A little argument went on there, it seems. But he said, Father, I want them to be one with me as I'm one with you. No separation. How could that possibly take place, John would say later? It had to be rebirthed. There's no way that will work unless they're rebirthed. No way. They're going to have to be rebirthed. Thirty years later, when he wrote his epistles, that was the signal part of his first epistle. That was a highlight. It was in reading his viewpoint of the birthing that I came up with the word birthing. I hadn't heard that from anybody as far as I know, and I shouldn't say that because I do a lot of reading, and it may have gone into my mind and I didn't know where it came from. But when I got a hold of this, I came up with the word birthing because I could see that people who claim to be born again don't know what it means and are going to live and die and sit in a church building 50 years and never find out about it. And yet everybody will be challenged, be born again. Get them down this altar, be born again. But never know about it. So the thought came to me, that's a birthing. That's a rebirthing. That's God taking this creature he has made in his image and likeness that got perverted by a corruptible seed, got perverted by Adam and Eve's sin, and they've lived on this earth for generations, and they tried to correct that sin, and it's not out of them yet. It's not gone yet. And so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take every one of these people who want to be free of their sin and old life and I'm going to put another life in them. And I only got one life that pleases me and that's Christ. So I'm going to baptize them, place them in Christ. I'm going to immerse them in Christ. Not water baptism there. The word baptism means immersed into the person of Christ so that you lose all semblance. I no longer live. Christ liveth in me. I want you to mark what he has to say about the birthing. I had a fellow come to me not long ago. He said, I'm not coming back to any more of your meetings. I said, how come? He said, you talk about that thing called birthing, and it scares me to death, and it must be unscriptural. <laughs> you know what I'd done? I had brought to him a term that reached much deeper in him than me saying, you must be born again. You see, to be rebirthed is the whole of what salvation is. So let's look at some of these things. Go with me to 1 John. First John. I want you to mark these scriptures. Mark these scriptures. In the second chapter of John, let's begin reading at, uh, oh, let's read verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him. Abide in him. You know, when most people read John 15, that's what they got out of it. We've got to abide in Christ. And uh, there are other places in the Scripture where the word abide is used so much. You ever try to abide in Christ? Did you ever try to be who you were? <laughs> My wife's a Irish she doesn't try to be Irish. She is Irish. <coughs> I was born a German. I don't try to be a German. It's what I am. Both of us 
were something else before we were born again. When we got born again, Paul says in Christ there are no Germans and Irishmen. That helped a lot. <laughs> we tried to be something we were not. That's worn out more Christians than anything else, them trying to abide in Christ. That's them soulishly trying to be something that God never let the soul enter into. They could be perfectly rebirthed in spirit if they knew about it. But their soul is going to be a lifetime catching up with that. Their mind is going to be a lifetime catching up with it. But you have to start somewhere. So abiding in Christ could be a lot of hard work for you. Verse 28. And now little children abide in him that when he shall appear. Praise God I believe that. We shall have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. <laughs> Where else is that word used? Where else is it used? A workman who needeth not to be ashamed. What is that, Hebrews 4 and 12? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. These fellows were interested in us not being ashamed. God must really be ashamed of humanity. Because I look at them and I give them a lot of grace. I, I are one of them. But I'm not ashamed as I ought to be. We need to talk about that later. Not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know, now here it is, that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Mark it. Right beside the word birth. 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 Incorruptible seed. Birth of him. You've been birthed by him. You didn't join the church, be baptized in water, and start doing good works to get saved. You were birthed by God, and there's not anything better than that to come to you in all your life. Amen. If you just knew it. Notice what else it says. Everyone that is birthed of Him, and let's say everyone that knows they're birthed by Him. Uh, go back to the word, everyone that's not ashamed in the previous verse. Let everyone that's not ashamed come to the conclusion that because they're birthed of Him, they are righteous. That's Christ in you. 1 Corinthians 1 and 30. Christ has been made unto us. How can He make anything in me? He's in me. He has been made unto us wisdom, righteous sanctification, and redemption. We've been birthed by Him. Skip, skip on down into chapter 3. Here, here's that statement I was talking about a moment ago. In verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest that He might destroy the works of the devil. Now, don't get all worked up over this statement. Because we're going we're gonna to put that in a category. John's going to say back in the first chapter of, of John that if any of us say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So don't confuse the two things that are being said here. He's saying, He that committed sin is of the devil. How did I commit sin of the devil? He was my nature. He was in me. He was my nature. Did I ever do good when I was of the devil? My nature was of the devil. Did I ever do good? Sure I did. I went to church. I didn't put money in the offering pan. When the preacher got up and said, we don't have anybody to help us this next Saturday on a work day, my hand went up. I'll be there. I did good things, but I still had the sin nature in me. As of the devil. Now that's what we're not telling sinners. See, they don't know that. And so when they come to Christ, they don't understand how Christ is in them because they didn't understand how the devil was in them. 
the, that's the lacking of the gospel. Beating around the bush, as I call it. For the devil sent us from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about things that we do from our spirit. The spirit of man joined to the devil does the works of the devil. The spirit of man joined to the spirit of Christ, not the Holy Spirit, joined to the spirit of Christ. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Romans 8 and 9. Verse 9, whosoever is born, <coughs> whosoever is born, birthed of God. Are you getting it? I'm trying to bring that word out to you. Whosoever is birthed of God does not commit sin. Why doesn't a person who is birthed by God sin? Now, what are we talking about? We're not talking about his soul. We're talking about where he was rebirthed. In his spirit. Why doesn't a person that's been rebirthed, born of God, in his spirit commit sin? The next line tells us, for the seed remains in him. What is it that makes me sinless in spirit with Christ joined to me? I've been rebirthed. What makes me sinless? The seed is there. An incorruptible seed is there. And he cannot sin because he is birthed of God. Well, we won't take a lot of time now. Sometime we'll talk about this. What's the difference between soul and spirit? Spirit is perfectly saved. Spirit is perfectly saved. Second Corinthians 1 and 10 says, we are saved, perfectly saved from death. That's the old life we're in. We are being saved. That's in our soul. We will be saved, the verse says, on the resurrection morning when we get another body. Paul simplified it. He cut through all the Judaistic teaching that's even in the Bible. And he says, a believer of Jesus Christ is saved in spirit, is righteous in his person. And what else does he say here? says that he cannot sin does not. He says here he does not sin. He doesn't sin. Doesn't sin in his spirit. Then what is he talking about over here in 1 John 1 and 9 where he says confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us. He's talking about the we thing. Things we do. If you want to understand that better, go through that first chapter and circle all the we's on it. He's not talking about what God did to the human. He's talking about what we do to ourselves. So circle the we's there. In this, verse 10, are the children of God manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not a God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Go to another one. Fourth chapter of 1 John. Verse 7. 1 John 4 and 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. What a statement. I'm going to give you something that will help you if you want it. You'll never come to know God until you understand the birthing. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? He said, except you be born again, you cannot see or enter the things of God. You want to know God? Better still, you want to know who you are? You want to know? Here's your answer. God is love. And that comes because you've been birthed by God. Beloved, let us love one another. And everyone that does that is birthed of God and comes to know God because of it. Now, that's so simple when I read it there. But I remember the struggle I had, knowing God, I already know all about God. I've already studied it all. 
I've read all the books. I've taught it from Genesis to Revolutions. I've taught it. I knew all about God and the things he did, but I didn't know God because that knowledge had been kept from me. You know by whom? The Holy Spirit. He's the only one that could tell us that. It's written in the book, but how many of us preachers read it in the book and don't have the slightest idea what it means? We think we do. But the Holy Spirit is the key. He's the one that will help you. Notice what he says. Everyone that loveth God is born of God and knows God. See, what does that do? That puts this thing called the birthing in a whole different light. Don't associate it with your soul. Your soul never will catch up with that birth. The way you think and the way you live will never catch up with that birth. And that's exactly why God put it in the book. Because he said, I've had 4,000 years of Old Testament saints that never did what I said. And now then, I'm not going to depend upon them doing something. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to put my son in them. And I'm going to trust my son that lives in them rather than them. That's what Christianity is. Then you say we can all live as we please. Far from it. If I know he's there and I love him, I wouldn't do anything to affect that. I'd be a fool to affect that. But that's got to be preached to you enough till it gets in your mind and then you'll stop doing foolish things. I've got to hurry along here. They're telling me to quit. Go with me to chapter 5. Are you marking all these now? Whosoever believe, verse 1, Whosoever believeth Jesus is, is the Christ is birth of God. That's, you, want, you, know, you want a simplification of that first line? Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the life of the human is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that birthed Everyone that loveth him that birthed, loveth him that is birthed of God. Three times in one verse. That's what born again is all about. Skip down to verse 4. Whosoever is birthed of God overcomes the world. See, don't Come and tell me you're having a big problem with the world. You just can't quit the things of the world. What your problem is, it's in your birthing or it's in your knowing whether or not you're birthed. Whosoever overcometh the world is birth of God. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Even our faith. Verse 18. This finishes them up. Verse 18. We know that whosoever is birthed of God sinneth not. But he that is birthed of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. That's what I'm trying to tell you. If you don't have a love affair going on in your soulish part with the Christ that lives in you, you're not going to live right. I've told you before, I preached law for many years, and I preached grace for many years. And I can tell you this, neither one of them are worth a nickel to a believer if they don't love God. You don't love Him. Don't run around saying, well, I'm in grace. It's going to all work out. No, your problem is love. What takes place in the soul? Why does the Holy Spirit work in our soulish part? Jesus said back in John uh, 16, that when the Holy Spirit has come, he'll not speak of himself, he'll speak only of me. And that the Holy Spirit will take the things of mine and reveal them unto you. What's wrong? Jesus knew in those passages that human beings were going to have Christ in them, but if the Holy Spirit didn't help them, it wouldn't matter. It just wouldn't matter. So he says that the love affair you have with the Christ in you will cause you to keep yourself from sin. Amen. 
Isn't that simple? What makes a good husband not run around on his wife? He loves her. What makes children obey parents? They love them. We kind of run out of that stuff, haven't we? Kind of run out of it. I heard a statistic this week on the news that 50% of Americans generally were divorced and that of that 50% that divorced, the greatest number in that were Christian people. You say, are they saved? I don't answer that. They probably are. They've just never heard the gospel. They've never gotten the message about who they are. It's not hard to live the Christian life because you don't live it. It's not hard for a man and a woman to make a marriage work because they don't have to work on it all the time. They have to love each other more than they love themselves. And then talk it all out. Getting into this subject is something some of you have heard many times, and I suppose we've got tapes on it somewhere, I don't know. But I want you to know that Christ is in you if you ever got saved, and that He's never left you, and that your salvation depends on Christ and not on you. So drop the heavy load you carry of trying to do what is right, and learn, fourth chapter of Ephesians, learn this Christ that lives in you. Learn it. A Christian is one in whom Christ lives and they know it. Practice it and make it so. Well, enough said. I stop right there. I tell you about the best group of people I've seen, at least this day. <laughs> God love every one of you. It's a blessing to see you and to have you here. And now then I want everybody to reach over and take your neighbor by the hand. Just reach over and take your neighbor by the hand. You can sit or stand. And if there's just two of you there where I'm talking now, reach over and take the other one by the hand. And if there's nobody there, just take a good person by the hand like this. Yours, yours, yours. Take your neighbor by the hand and kind of look him in the eye because you're not going to find anything like this anywhere else in the world where you've got somebody standing by you that has Christ living in them. Think of that. This is our benediction, and you simply look them in the eye and say, I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you. In your life and all that you do. I see Jesus in you because I see Jesus in me. I see Jesus in me. In my life and all that I do. I see Jesus in you. Now, dear friends, before you leave, hug every neck you can get to. God love you till we meet together again.